Hello everybody, Mobius1 here, bringing you another Star Wars Galaxies emulator episode. Uh, for those of you that haven't been playing Galaxies much lately, or maybe missed the video that I posted uh, in the middle of last week, um, Publish 7 has been merged onto the Basilisk server. Uh, and with that, we get a whole bunch of new changes, a whole bunch of new content, and uh, things that a lot of people have been looking forward to, actually, for quite some time. Uh, I'm going to get this question answered right out of the gate. No, Jedi has not been added to Basilisk yet. Oh, I know. For all, if all of you, if that's what you came here for, you can close the video now. No, wait, don't do that. There's plenty more stuff coming, I promise. Um, no, Jedi has not been added yet. It's still something that they're working on. Uh, many of you have heard me say this already in the past, uh, but for those of you that haven't, the Jedi professions are actually completed. Uh, many people wonder, you know, what's taking them so long? How come Jedi are on other servers already, but Basilisk uh, doesn't have them yet? Um, the answer is, is basically that. The professions are done. However, the village system is not. And the village system is really what uh, is, the, is the path to unlocking Jedi that this version of Galaxies is uh, using. So Basilisk doesn't want to, or the developers of Basilisk, don't want to allow players to become Jedi until that system is complete, and that's the only way that they can make it fair. Otherwise, people can unlock Jedi early, and then maybe the, the system that they've used now is going to be easier than the village system, so then when the village system gets added, people feel like, you know, they got kind of che cheated, that they weren't playing early. I, I, don't, I don't know why exactly but it's to me it seems like it's the most fair way to do it is if they just don't allow anyone to be jedi until they're done with the village system so if you just want to play a jedi go play the old republic i mean the, everybody's a jedi there anyway uh so yeah published seven was released on june 7th and actually published six came out way back in november so it uh it was november 16th so it was it's been about six and a half almost almost seven months uh, since Publish 6 came out, and that's about average. So uh, I, I, I say they take about six or seven months per publish, so we can expect to see Publish 8 come out probably in December or January of 2016. So maybe if Jedi's on the checklist for Publish 8, which we don't know yet, but believe me, I am keeping my eyes, the Publish 8 checklist is public. Um, I'm keeping my eyes on it, so I'll let you know if I see anything, but uh, we can expect the next major update to come out come out right around holidays this year, if not a little bit after, early next year. So, what uh, if Jedi is not part of Publish 7, what is? Now actually, uh, as I do most of these videos, many of you know I, I pretty much just wing these. Um, I find it way too tedious to make like a checklist of bullet points to go through so I have the patch notes up on my second monitor I'm just kind of gonna read over them and uh, I'll stop and explain anything important that I come across but for the most part um, the Basilisk has greatly improved server stability unfortunately that still means we we're still getting rubber bands and um, a lot of people complain that the Basilisk shuts down uh, every 24 hours and uh, the reason behind that is right now, uh, mobs in the wild aren't despawning properly. So mobs, I believe, if no player is near them for a certain amount of time, are supposed to despawn. And they're not doing that. So what happens is, as people drive around the world, there's a dynamic spawn system that actually causes those wild creatures and, and mobs to spawn out in the wilderness. And over time, since those mobs aren't despawning, the server can get overloaded because it's calculating the AI for so many mobs that people are just, you know, ignoring. Um, so the 24-hour restart is kind of used to clean that up. That way the server doesn't get overloaded and eventually crash. Um, but that's not, un you know, that's not unlikely, or, or sorry, that's not unheard of. I believe the Galaxy servers back in live used to do 24-hour restarts also, so that's nothing really to be uh, surprised about. And it's usually only down for about an hour, so it's really not that big of a problem. Uh, okay, so for spawns and, and world emissions, 
Uh, they, the most important thing, they have added dynamic Black Sun spawns to Dathomir, Endor, and Yavin 4. Now I'm going to get into this a little bit later. I'm going to save this for towards the end of the video. Um, Endor Smuggler Outpost now has a functional tavern, so you guys can buff up there. Taming a baby at a static spawn will no longer cause that mob to cease respawning. That's for creature handlers. This is neat. A Sarlacc will now erupt and disease anyone nearby when a player approaches too closely. I actually do remember this from live, so now when you go to get the Sarlacc uh, POI on, on either Tatooine, or actually there are a couple on, on Dathomir, uh, when you get nearby there will actually be an animation of the Sarlacc. Maybe, I don't know if there's an animation or not, but there will be a system message saying that the Sarlacc pit erupts violently or something like that, and everybody in the area gets diseased. So it's actually a little bit more dangerous now than it used to be. Um, Alright, so it does say all type of dynamic spawns will now despawn when no player has been in range for five minutes instead of just lair spawns. I don't know if that's working correctly yet, uh, but they're trying, so that's kind of what I was just talking about. Added distant ship flyovers above static cities. This is actually something that that uh, is not very important, but it definitely gives you more of a Star Wars-y feel. You can't, I can't demonstrate it here because I'm actually out at the Ewok Tree Village, for those of you who haven't noticed. Um, but now, when you're in a major city, if you actually look up, you'll see like TIE fighters and shuttles and stuff kind of flying overhead. Just like these birds. Look at this. I don't think I've ever even noticed. There are all kinds of birds and wildlife flying over on Endor. That's really cool. But, uh, but yeah, so that's, it's just something else to make you feel more like you're in a living, thriving universe added many more possible destroy missions to all planets and faction terminals including many humanoid missions hallelujah praise the, praise the devs this means janta missions and all sort of uh dantuanian tribesmen missions are back on the mission terminals on dantuan so we could do janta missions kunga missions mock missions uh, Dantari missions, they're all back on the mission terminals now. Now you are going to have to be in a solo group, and as a matter of fact, I have a video talking about solo missions. It's uh, the money-making guide for combat professions. It's a two-parter. I don't remember what episode number it is, but if you look at my Galaxy's playlist uh, and just do a search for, like, money-making, uh, it should come up. But basically, this is the best way to earn money as a combat profession other than Bounty Hunter. And uh, they did make them a little bit more difficult, but they also increased the payout. I think back when I made the money-making video, the average payout I was getting for a Janta mission was about 22 to 24,000 credits a mission. Now they're doing 27 to 28,000. So the increased payout does kind of counter the difficulty spike. Um, but it is important to note that the, that the Jantas will now actually dizzy, knock down, bleed, blind, stun, and intimidate you. I believe they do all of those. Um, so it is, it is definitely more difficult. Uh, the reason behind that is creatures, NPCs, and AI now in, uh, in, this, in Publish 7 will now actually use special attacks. So instead of just hitting you with a default attack, enemies are actually going to be using the same sort of special moves that you have as a player against you. That makes combat much more challenging in Publish 7. It's actually a little bit refreshing. Um, it's Combat is still more or less button spammy, but like if you're buffed with armor, uh, it's not... You know, it's it's not compared to like a Skyrim combat or or Elder Scrolls Online. Even it's it's still very spammy, but you do have to pay attention to your health a lot more now, especially that AI is going to be hitting you with with uh, moves like Overcharge Shot and uh, and knocking you down a lot more often. Now, um, also it says many mobs now distinguish between special protections and effectiveness uh, effectiveness resist when examined all right so that's just in the examine window uh, fix the resists of armor of many mobs wild creatures and wild tamed creature pets will now always have a 2.0 attack speed not retroactive to existing pets so this is important um, so creature handler pets attack speeds have been reduced a little bit so they'll actually attack a little bit quicker 
But the problem is, any pets that were tamed prior to Publish 7 are not going to be changed. So, unfortunately for you creature handlers out there, if you really want to get the best pets that you can get, you're gonna have to retame your entire collection. It's a little bit disappointing, but I think in the long run it'll be worth it, because then your pets will be much better than they are now. Um... Fix special attacks on many creatures. Yep, creatures will now use their special attack. Yep, mobs will no longer regen ham while in combat, but will now regen it faster when not in combat. So that's actually important. Uh, if you didn't already notice, previously when you were fighting a creature, it's much more noticeable on large boss creatures like uh, crate dragons, but the, the mobs were actually regenerating their health while you were fighting them. And in a really long fight against like a crate dragon, that could add up to a lot of health over time. So now in Pueblo 7, um, creatures will no longer regenerate health during combat, but as soon as they break out of combat, their health is going to jump back up pretty significantly. So, so that's just something to keep aware of. Uh, fix several other mob details. Most NPCs should now have randomly generated names, and I think I can, yeah. So I can actually demonstrate that here. If I, before, when you used to click on an NPC, it would just say, in this case, a Panshe tribesman. Now, they all have these randomly generated Aishi Bakir and Hayos Azequive, a Panshe tribesman. It's just, again, something... To, to add some depth to the universe. Is it an important change? No. Is it something that, that adds more flavor to galaxies? Sure. So, why not? Uh, many NPCs will now be talkative in reaction to their environment. So this, I don't think I can actually demonstrate this here because these are uh, Ewoks, but uh, you'll notice it definitely in major cities. Certain NPCs will actually will talk to you. So, sometimes in Mos Eisley, there's usually a stormtrooper guarding the starport entrance. Now, every once in a while, when you exit the starport, or anytime anybody walks past him, he may say something to spatial chat, such as, move along, citizen, or nothing to see here. It's, again, adding depth to the universe. Not, not a huge change, but something that makes the game more interesting. Uh, AI will no longer be aggressive towards vehicles, but will still be able to attack them. And I can tell you firsthand that that is true. Um, also, since many more creatures and, and mobs are using area attacks, uh, or I'm sorry, using specials, you do need to be aware of them using area attacks. The Janta missions that I was doing, uh, actually I dismounted from my vehicle a little bit too close to the mission and it happened to be within range of an area attack and they still blew up my vehicle even though they were attacking me. So it's good to know that, uh, that uh, mobs aren't going to s target your vehicle specifically but that doesn't guarantee your vehicle won't get blown up so you still have to be safe. Uh, mobs will now be less, less prone to fleeing when a player approaches. Uh, Imperial NPCs no longer take disrespectful emotes directed towards them lightly and will respond. This is important, especially for, uh, for rebel players. Rebel or neutral players, it's less important for Imperial players, and I'll tell you why. Basically, now you don't want to disrespect an Imperial NPC. If you do, you will be fined credits, and you will be knocked incapacitated. Uh, if you're a rebel or a neutral player, and you slash spit, slash slap, any any kind of offensive emote to a, while targeting an Imperial NPC, you will immediately find yourself incapacitated, and you may be fined uh, like 5,000 credits or something like that. Not Nothing serious, but... Again, you, you don't want to do it. Uh, if you're an Imperial, it's a little bit different. Not only uh, will you be fine, you will you may also lose faction points with the Empire. Unless you're a higher rank than the NPC you're doing the emote to, in which case they will cower in your presence. So it's a little bit funny that you can, you can kind of uh, put your you know, flex your power over over the uh, the younglings, or not the younglings, whatever, the underlings of uh, of the Empire, if you're, if you're so ranked enough. Uh, let's see. AI can now be aggressive towards players who are riding a mountain or vehicle. Okay, so that just means when 
uh, when you drive by, the, the mobs are going to aggro on you and not your vehicle. Adjusted aggro determination so that aggressive NPCs will aggro more reliably and from further away. So aggro radiuses have been increased, or radii, I guess? They've been increased, so now you'll actually pull mobs from a greater distance, so be safe. Uh, or just keep that in mind. Um, ba -ba -ba. Mobs are more likely to engage their enemies in combat. Mob versus mob. Now this is something that's most noticeable in like the Warren. So if you watch my Warren video, you saw there were like Imperial workers and those uh, crazed Hurtins running around within the Warren, and they were just kind of standing there. Now with Pablo 7, they'll actually be fighting each other. So when you enter, you can actually sit back and let them fight it out, and then go in and pick off the victor instead of having to fight the entire room yourself. So that's pretty cool. Uh, aggressive mobs are much less likely to drop aggro when a player tries to slash peace. Tougher mobs should now apply longer lasting states. A mob's resistances will now degrade based on their battle fatigue. So the more you fight a mob, their resistances could actually drop. That's cool. Uh, added loot to some mobs that were dropping none before. And Jedi Sentinels no longer drop loot, give very little XP when killed, and will respawn faster. Now, I... I'm not going to talk about the Jedi Sentinels just yet. Well, that's I'm going to make a video covering that later, but that is... Uh, th there are a couple of Jedi NPCs on uh, Yavin 4 that m some of you probably know about, guarding the Light, uh, Light Jedi and Dark Jedi enclaves. That's what that is. Alright, so here's some big ones. Events, dungeons, theme parks, and quests. Added the Hero of Tatooine quest. This is big, because I didn't actually know that they were adding this in Pablo 7. I knew they were working on it, but I didn't know that it was finished. The Hero of Tatooine quest is probably the most difficult uh, quest that you can do in the game solo. Uh, I'm going to definitely make a video go, go, going over this, but basically the Hero of Tatooine quest is a very long quest that, all that takes place all on Tatooine. Uh, it's like a six or a seven part quest that involves finding random spawns that can be anywhere on Tatooine and have ridiculous respawn timers. I'm talking like three hour timers. Um, so if somebody finds one, it's going to be three hours before the thing even respawns. So it, when you're doing the quest, you could be driving around the planet looking for something that hasn't, that's not even there. That's how ridiculous this quest is. However, the reward for completing the Hero of Tatooine quest, not only do you get several badges in your inventory, you get a badge in your inventory for, or I'm sorry, bio. You get a badge in your bio for each part of the quest that you complete. Um, you get a house, uh, a couple of different housing decorations. And when you finish the very last part, you get a ring that you can equip called the Mark of the Hero that lets you revive yourself from death 50 times. That is worth fighting for. Uh, especially as a Jedi, that is worth fighting for. So that's just, that's just uh, something else that they added. And like I said, I'll do a video guide go over, going over that at some point. I haven't even started it yet myself because I know how ridiculous it is and I want to make sure that uh, that they get all the bugs worked out of it before I waste my time looking for mobs that aren't properly respawning and stuff. I don't know if there are any bugs in it, but hey, um, any time a publish gets added to Basilisk, there's always the possibility of things not working exactly the way they want them to. Um, okay. Add a generic quest to criminal scientists, businessmen, and nobles, so you can pick up random fetch quests from random NPCs. Rewrote all existing Death Watch Bunker code to fix issues with it. Yes, that is right, folks. The Death Watch Bunker is active. What does that mean? That means Mandalorian armor and jetpacks for all. With a little asterisk next to it that says, For all that want to put the time in because it is very, very time-consuming to find all the pieces that you need to make Mandalorian armor and jetpacks. Uh, some will disagree with me on that, but I guess it depends on, on how big of a group you have, especially with the way that Black Sun mobs are spawning on the, on the three planets now. And like I said, I'll, I'll get into that at the end of the video. Uh, added new functionality to the Death Watch Bunker. The Bestie Museum Curator no longer limits a player to one schematic purchase. 
Captain Hef should now remove the Warren evidence from your data pad when you turn it in. That's kind of a... Uh, it's kind of a problem I have because we I've completed the Warren uh, before Publish 7, so now I have these evidence disks in my inventory or my data pad that I can't even delete if I wanted to. But uh, I guess it's not that big of a deal. So now when you turn in the quest reward... Or I'm sorry, when you turn in the quest uh, to get your reward from Captain Hef, he'll actually take those out of your data pad. Uh, fixed a couple of issues with Nim's theme park containers. Combat! Okay, let me just go through this. Yeah, fix some spam. Players can no longer be attacked while loading. Most of these are minor changes. Players in the same group can no longer attack each other except when in a duel. Okay. Slash Peace will now clear the combat queue. That's interesting because before, if you were trying to break combat with a mob, you would have to uh, make sure you were clicking on the clear combat queue button that appears like up here and uh, Peace at the same time. Otherwise your character would continue to attack with whatever actions you had queued up. Now the Slash Peace command actually clears that for you. So it's a little bit of improving the quality of life. Um, counterattacks have been fixed and re-enabled, that's good. Adjusted melee combat range to account for latency when chasing a moving target. So this is a pretty big deal. Before, I think melee attacks had like a minimum or a maximum range of 5 meters, and the lunge attacks had a range of 10 meters. Now, all melee special attacks have a range of 10 meters. And the lunge moves, there's an unarmed lunge, a one-handed lunge, two-handed lunge, and a pole-arm lunge, have a range of 20 meters. So this is good because there is a little bit of latency, like if a, if a character starts to run, you may not see him running until after he's already, you know, five, six meters away from you. So what this allows you to do is actually pursue the target and still attack him before he gets out of range, even though... Oh, excuse me. Um... Because before, he might be out of range, even though on your client, it looks like he's still right next to you. So that gives you a little bit of leg room. Uh, especially in PvP, that's nice. Um, multiple attributes can now be wounded by a single attack. Mobs now have hitboxes that will no longer be required to stand inside. Okay, yeah, mobs now have hitboxes, and one will no longer be required to stand inside of larger creatures to hit them in melee. That's awesome, too, because before... A, like a huge creature like a crate dragon can take up a good amount of space, right? Like from tail from nose to tail, it could be about 30 meters. I'm just taking a guess. And out of those 30 meters, if you were standing at his nose, you would be 15 meters away from the center of the crate dragon. So the game would actually calculate you as being 15 meters away, and you would be out of range, out of melee range at least. So now with this, since mobs have hitboxes, you could actually be standing, you know, not necessarily in the center of the creature, but still be within range because that creature is much bigger. So that's that's great. Uh, added generic weapon type checks to a combat commands, blah, blah, blah. PvP house TEFs have been added. A player executing abilities in PvP will now be ejected from and won't be able to enter a player structure for five minutes. Hooray! This is something else that we've been wanting back for a long time. TEFs, temporary enemy flags. Basically, it's this is a very important system, especially with Jedi coming soon, TM. Uh, that prevents anybody who engages in PvP from entering player structures for five minutes. Why is that important? Well, let's say... Let's say I'm a Jedi, and I'm hanging out in my city on lock, and a bounty hunter rolls up and starts shooting at me, and I have a house in town that's a private structure. Before this TEF system was introduced, there would be nothing stopping me from running into that private house and just waiting until the bounty hunter got too bored or, you know, I could safely log off and go play on an alt or something. Uh, and there would be nothing, no way the bounty hunter could get to me while, ever I, while I was in that private house. With this system now, as soon as that bounty hunter fires his first shot at me, I am locked out of all player structures for five minutes. And it's, it's five minutes from the last time the last attack so every time he hits me or every time I hit him that five minute timer refreshes so I would have to run from him for five minutes without him shooting me once or me striking back at him once in order before I could go into a private house to hide 
So that's it's good that that's back because that balances the game dramatically. Uh, it should no longer be possible to incapacitate oneself by using combat abilities. That's good, especially for those of you that uh, if your buffs run out while you're grinding and you don't realize it and you're spamming your specials and your action drains and next thing you know you killed yourself because you didn't have any buffs. Uh, can't do that anymore. Uh, healing now generates less threat. That's good. So now doctors or combat medics that are in the group healing shouldn't be getting attacked by super battle droids in the Death Watch bunker. Um, okay, many more actions are now prevented by War Cry. Many more actions are now prevented by swimming. Blah, blah, blah. Modify the formula for state application defense's chance to be closer to live. Intimidation now lowers min and max damage instead of just max damage. Intimidation from different sources now stack their effect. And Intimidation now also lowers primary defenses. What does this mean? This means intimidate your targets, folks. Intimidation just got really buffed. Uh, increase the chance to successfully stand while dizzy. That's good. Increase the damage and accuracy bonus and the defense penalty from going berserk. The stunned state now imposes a larger damage reduction. Slightly increase the accuracy penalty from the blinded state. So basically all states just got really buffed. So they're going to be much more important now to apply your different status effects, which is why Terrace Kasi is actually a good utility profession because we get access to just about all of them. We get stun, dizzy, knockdown, blind, intimidate, war cry. We even get uh, yeah, taunt. I think that's just a brawler move, though. Uh, anyway. Uh, fixed knockdown and posture change delays and dizzy flopping. So before, you guys may remember, if you were dizzy and knocked down and you tried to stand up, your character would kind of flop around on the floor. Doesn't do that anymore. He just kind of lays there. So it looks, it looks a lot better. Uh, not quite as funny anymore, but that's okay. Vehicles are now immune to states. ATSTs and ATATs are now immune to states. And uh, knockdown. When applying mul multiple dots of the same type and pool to a target, weaker ones will no longer overwrite stronger ones. That's awesome. Reapplying a dot with the same or greater strength will no longer push back the tick of the existing dot. Instead, it extends its duration and increases its strength to that of the new one, if greater. Weapon dots can now be applied one per weapon rather than one per type of weapon. The damage of dots applied from weapons attacks is now reduced by the target's armor. Bleeds now do damage once every 20 seconds. Uh, dots are no longer automatically cleared from a player or pet that is incapacitated and will resume their damage slash wounding when the player or pet recovers. Players must now be within 80 meters of a mob when it dies to gain XP from the kill. Uh, damage from dots now count towards kill credit. That's huge! So before, combat medics used to be able to solo crate dragons, but unfortunately since Publish 6 came out, uh, any damages done by uh, dot effects, such as bleeds or poisons, actually uh, were going against the player's loot rights. It was almost as if the mob was taking damage from another player that wasn't actually present. So if uh, by the time that crate dragon died, if that crate dragon had taken more damage from the poison and bleeds than the player did to the crate dragon directly, the player actually wouldn't get loot rights. The loot rights would go to the dots. Uh, so that bug has been fixed. So that's good. Um... Disengaging from combat during a battle will no longer clear a player's credit towards loot rights. Okay, that's good. All right, so on to some profession changes. Artisan. Yeah, they fixed a couple things that couldn't be crafted. Vehicle customization kits can now be crafted in a generic crafting tool, uh, which you do need to get a new tool for that. Um, I'm just. I am going to put the link to this in the description, of course. Uh, the video description so if you guys want to take a look at some of the stuff I'm skipping over I'm trying to get all the major like important stuff but this video has already been about a half hour and I'm only about half oh my god no I'm not even halfway through these so I'm not gonna go over everything uh, if you guys have any specific questions about some of this stuff 
I'm just going to skip the profession section completely. You guys can go in and look at your own professions to see what was changed. Because this is going to take forever. Uh, items loot. Anti Anti-decay kits as veteran rewards. So ADKs, anti-decay kits. They are, I believe, a one-year veteran reward, and you get them. You get one per account. Basically, an ADK allows you, you to apply, uh, or you apply it onto a weapon or armor, to prevent that weapon or armor from ever losing condition. Um, that's awesome, especially if you have a really expensive piece of gear. Um, that's really the only thing you want to use the ADK on. Since you can only get one per account, they're currently selling on the trade forums for like 20 million credits each. Yeah, they're expensive. So if you if you have one, you might just want to hold on to it. Um, but they added a bunch of new stuff to the loot tables. Removing a power up from a weapon now destroys it rather than placing it back in your inventory. So be careful of that. When applying an attachment with multiple same value skill mods, the first listed should now properly be chosen. That's important. I actually went back and added an annotation to my last uh, C's video and, and stated that because that was something that I wasn't sure about back then. This is important. Adjusted weapon decay. Weapons now have a chance to decay by one point with every attack, instead of always decaying by a fraction of a point with every attack. Uh, unfortunately, this has seemed to increase the rate at which weapons decay. So, while you're out grinding, be sure you to keep an eye on your weapon condition. I believe that they're decaying faster than intended, but I do know that the devs are working on a hotfix for it. I just don't know when they're going to apply it. Um, so just keep an eye on your weapon condition for now. Alright, pets. Some stuff has been changed for pets. Pets can now patrol, which is really cool. You can set patrol points for your pets. That includes your faction pets, and they'll actually walk between patrol points. So it's really cool when you go into Theed or Moss Eisley. Now you see a lot of Imperial players have their ATSTs and Stormtroopers patrolling the town. It's pretty cool. Um, okay, it should no longer be possible to get stuck with an unhealable, non-damaging dot state. That was a bug that they had in Puzzle 6. A player can now claim a new veteran reward for every 360 days occurred beyond the preset milestones. So now, every year, basically, beyond the preset milestones, you get to choose another veteran reward. Uh, okay, group or guild. These aren't really worth mentioning in this video. Well, and I guess this is good. A group leader can now select the loot rule to use. Uh, functional rules might now include a free-for-all and master looter. So those of you that have played more uh, modern MMOs are probably familiar with loot rights. But basically a group leader can set the loot rules to master looter. Which means when you guys, uh, when you go around killing mobs as a group, only the group leader has rights to loot the corpses. Uh, player cities. There's been a couple changes to player cities. I'm not going to go over most of them here, because uh, I do plan on making a city guide in the future, uh, including with a politician guide also. But basically, uh, basically the most important thing now that ma mayors are getting mails for a lot of things that they weren't getting mails uh, for before, which helps incredibly, especially for when citizens leave the city. Uh, that's great. City band players no longer receive the benefits of a city specialization. Yeah, okay. Alright, so let's... Okay. Let's go over the most important change, which is the, uh, the Death Watch Bunker and the Black Sun, because this video is already getting a lot longer than I expected it to be. So... Dynamic Black Sun spawns are now, have been added to Dathomir, Endor, and Yavin 4. So, why is this important? So, okay, in order to craft Mandalorian armor and a jetpack, 
you need very specific materials, including loot that can only be obtained from certain NPCs. Now, some of these can be obtained inside the Death Watch bunker itself, uh, which we will be doing a Death Watch bunker guide as soon as uh, we get some of the loot ourselves and we, you know, put a guild event together to go down there and do that. Um, however, other pieces of loot must be obtained outside of the Death Watch bunker. So Black Sun NPCs inside the Death Watch bunker actually do not drop the same loot as Black Sun NPCs outside of the Death Watch bunker. Outside of the Death Watch bunker, the Black Sun NPCs have very, very small chances of dropping Bounty Hunter armor pieces and the very, very rare Jetpack base. Now, the Jetpack base has a 0.5% chance of dropping. That is a half of a percent chance. That means one out of every 200 kills should get you a piece. That's statistically speaking. Uh, but of course, that's that's not the way the real world works. You could get one on your first kill and you might not get any within your first thousand kills. Uh, that's, just, that's just statistics. Uh, but yeah, so that can only be obtained outside of the Death Watch Bunker. Now, why is it so hard to, to get these? Well, I should be on Yavin 4, but basically, in live, Black Sun mobs used to spawn in specific zones on uh, Endor, Yavin 4, and I didn't know they spawned on Dathomir, but apparently they did. Uh, unfortunately, the Galaxy's emulator crew haven't been able to get down the or pin down the code for localized spawning. What does that mean? That means <laughs> instead of knowing what area of the planet the Black Sun mobs are spawning on, they are now spawning anywhere on the planet instead. So, you literally have to comb the entire planet looking for these spawns. Now, there is one uh, thing that I should mention, uh, and that is currently these Black Sun spawns will respawn in the same location two to three times before selecting a new location. So, if you are lucky enough to find one of these groups of spawns, and when I say groups, uh, they spawn anywhere, they can spawn anywhere from one, like a single dude, to like a group of four, I think. Maybe five, but the most I've ever seen was four. Uh, in a single group. And, um, they are, they are pretty difficult to take down, uh, solo. Um, obviously, it depends on your gear, it depends on your professions, but I highly recommend being in a group, uh, when, when you go out looking for these guys. And I highly recommend getting them into melee combat range instead of uh, shooting at them from a distance because they do use overcharge shot and it can one shot kill you if you're not careful. Uh, it is, it's a very powerful move, especially if they happen to be using light lightning cannons uh, because then they're doing electricity damage and not energy. So you want to watch out for that, you want to get in the melee combat range with them, and you want to stick around the location after you clear the area to catch any respawns. Um, so yeah, so they drop the jetpack base, which is one piece required to make the jetpack. The other jetpack parts are all can all be farmed within the Death Watch bunker. Um, I don't remember all of them, it's like a fuel, fuel dispersal unit, jetpack stabilizer, which I think drops off of the Overlord at the very bottom, and... Uh, Ducted fan, I think. I, I don't remember. It's been a long time since I uh, since I read anything up on this. So again, I'll be doing a more specific video on this in the future. But the other thing, uh, the Black Sun outside of the Death Watch bunker drop are bounty hunter armor pieces. So Black Sun, they actually don't wear Mandalorian armor. They wear bounty hunter armor. It's two completely different sets. However, uh, bounty hunter armor is actually consumed in the crafting process for Mandalorian armor and it's needed to make Mandalorian armor so when you kill these Black Sun guys let's say you kill a Black Sun assassin and drop a bounty hunter armor uh, helmet sure you could wear the bounty hunter armor uh, bounty hunter armor helmet if you want 
or if you want to use it to craft a Mandalorian armor piece, it would also it would craft a Mandalorian armor helmet. So that's kind of how it works. Um, the crafting system is very complicated because it involves going all the way to the bottom of the Death Watch bunker with a crafter with a crafter basically. Um, but the type of crafter that you need to craft depends on what piece you're crafting. Like an armor smith can only make two or three pieces. Uh, I think you need like a master artisan for some other piece. You need a droid engineer for some other pieces. It's it's very complicated. Um, for those of you that are curious in it now, you could just do a Google search for like Death Watch Bunker Guide. But those of you that aren't or that are patient can just wait for my video on it. Uh, but yeah, those are all the major changes, really. Uh, no, why? Why hasn't anything about droids been mentioned in here? Hold on here. We have one other huge change. We have droids now. So, uh, yes, you could have had droids before, before Publish 7. However, they didn't do anything. Now with Publish 7, the droid modules actually function. And because of that, you can see here I have a nice little medical droid. I R heal you. And because of these medical droids, I can now actually buff myself even though I am nowhere near a medical center. Not only that, but uh, if the crafter is good enough, if the droid engineer is good enough, they can actually craft these medical droids uh, to, to give you an extra 10% to your buff strength. And this guy actually functions as a food and chemical crafting station. So I can actually craft buff packs uh, completely out in the, in the middle of nowhere as long as I have this droid next to me. How incredible is that? Droids are, have been a huge part of Star Wars Galaxies, and this is a huge feature that people are looking forward to. Every droid in the game is now functional. That includes medical droids, storage droids, harvesting droids, uh, combat droids, entertainer droids, uh, self-destruct droids. Every single droid that's in Star Wars Galaxies now works as part of Publish 7, and it, it is great. Um, they even have the, the advertising droids, power droids, so stop by your local droid engineer shop and pick up a couple of droids. I don't know what else to say. Um, the storage droids are great. Uh, they provide you with an extra 10 inventory slots at max, I believe. I know the ones that I have can hold up to 10 items. So once you generate the droid, because normally you can only hold 80 items in your inventory plus the 50 in your uh, equipped backpack. But now, just click and hold on your droid, droid options, open droid item storage compartment, boom, just like this. I can now store items in the droid himself, pull them out when I need them later, and then store the droid. How amazing is that? I'm surprised that I didn't see anything about that on the patch notes, but yes, that's it. So between the DWB and the droid modules now working, th those two things really are the biggest changes in Publish 7. Uh, I can't believe this video is coming up in 45 minutes, but I hope you guys found it informative. I hope you learned something that you might not have already known. Look forward to more uh, guides coming, especially with all the new content, and look forward to a couple of Star Wars Galaxies University guild videos in the future. So, Mobius1 here. Thanks for watching, guys. And I'll see you next time.